Hi, John Cornette back with you again. Uh, on this segment, we're going to talk about cash flow. If you haven't done so already, go ahead and download the notes so you can take notes as, and follow along as I go. Uh, as I have said in, in the other topics, there's really four foundational, fundamental uh, aspects of a successful retirement planning. We cover them at, at some level in each of the topics, but of course there's inflation, there uh, are taxes to understand taxes and manage your tax burden, there is cash flow and there's money management. So today we're going to talk about cash flow and why this is important in your retirement. So of course the first thing to do is to create some kind of a budget. Uh, one of the ways to create a budget of course is to track your expenses for the six months to a year before retirement. Uh, a lot of people will, when they're tracking this budget, you know, recognize expenses that they might be able to eliminate or reduce. Maybe you'll pay off your mortgage before retirement so you don't have a mortgage payment. Maybe you'll pay off credit cards. Maybe you'll buy a new car so you don't have a, a, a car payment. Now, of course, I've consolidated this as a part of the resources. There is a detailed uh, uh, list of budgets so you can look at every expense item. But clearly in housing would be your rent and your insurance and your taxes and the utilities. So I've just kind of combined them uh, for, for simplicity. Medical then would be your uh, health insurance and drugs and such. Uh, ACF is... Uh, auto, clothing, and uh, food. So I've combined all those together. Entertainment then uh, would, would be travel and gifts and entertainment and various things you would do. And then of course we have to add taxes to the budget. So in my example here, this person needs $60,000 a year in retirement to, to, to live. So the next step and, and this, you'll find that this is relatively process oriented. So in, in order to protect your cash flow and to develop cash flow, you really create a system or a process. And you'll see this throughout the uh, presentation. If you follow the process, then your cash flow will be uh, supported. The next step then is to take your outflow or your expenses and put them into two columns fixed and variable. Now, fixed expenses, of course, are those expenses that you can't change. If you have a mortgage, if you have a car payment, your insurance, your, your real estate tax bill, your condo fee, those things are fixed and you have to pay them. You can't change that. The medicines, uh, of course, and your health insurance and your drugs, you want that to be fixed. The uh, auto, Clothing and food, of course, is somewhat fixed and somewhat variable. Uh, you, you need to eat, but you can eat hamburger instead of steak. Uh, you can buy a cheaper car or buy less clothing. So in that particular line item, I've broken it up into a column or a portion that's fixed and a portion that's variable. So if the economy is bad, you can turn this piece off. Same thing with entertainment. Obviously, entertainment is, is a big variable expense. Of course, you want to spend money on entertainment. So some of it is fixed. You do need to go out to dinner. You do need to buy uh, gifts for your children and your grandchildren and such. Uh, but a big portion of your entertainment bill budget is uh, variable. It can be turned on and off. Then of course taxes, uh, taxes can't be turned off unfortunately, but they can be managed. So needless to say, if you're pulling more money out or you only have, uh, you're only spending 43,000 versus 60, then your tax bill would go down a little bit as well. So take your budget and break it into two columns. The column that's fixed that you can't change and the column that's variable, the column that you can turn on and off. The ability to turn this on and off and the recognition that you need to turn it on and off 
will become a very important um, point. So next we look at cash flow in. What are your sources of, of revenue and cash? And so there are uh, interest and dividends that you will receive off of your portfolio. Of course, Social Security. Maybe you have a pension or your spouse has a pension, so we can plug that in as well. And then I have something down here that's called market return. And this is the growth in your portfolio due to a positive stock market. And so that's 24,000 and you can see we've made up uh, in this example our $60,000 worth of cash coming in to match our $60,000 worth of cash going out. Now, we're going to take a minute and talk about this market return because it's uh, important to understand where this comes, to understand the short-term and the long-term nature of it, and understand how dividends play into the overall uh, budget from, that, from your portfolio. So let's take a look at that. <clears throat> My example is based on $800,000. So your IRA, your stocks, your bonds, your financial assets, uh, not counting your house, is $800,000. So a portion of that's going to be interest and dividends. This is guaranteed. This is fixed. There are many, many, many large companies and small companies that have never missed a dividend. They pay it each and every year. And there's a number of companies that not only pay their dividend each year, they raise it some each year. So interest in dividends is an extremely important component in the overall portfolio because it produces cash flow that's reliable and increases. <clears throat> the return, on the other hand, depends on the stock market going up. And we know the stock market doesn't always go up. When you think about the dividend component, dividends on stocks range from 0%, of course. Some stocks don't pay dividends, and, and some pay a dividend of 3% or so. So off of your $800,000 portfolio, you can calculate positive cash flow uh, in, in, in the 1% to 3% range. Again, you don't have to estimate this. You look at your portfolio, you know exactly what your dividend income is going to be. On the stock market return, we have a completely different dynamic because the stock market in the last uh, 20 years has, has had a low of negative 33.8%. So the market went down 33% and also in the same period, about a 33% positive return. So the question here is if the stock market is up, the market return exists and you can capture that, but in years when the stock market is down, obviously we don't wanna sell stocks because you're dipping into your principal in those down years. So. This is a fundamental concept that you want to pay attention to and understand that there are years when the market is up and there are years when the market is down and we need to protect against selling investments in the down years. So uh, a lot of the financial planning principles are based on a spending rate of about 4%. So if you take your portfolio and you multiply that by 4%, and you can spend that as, as added to your budget, added to your uh, uh, Social Security and your pensions and the other stuff, your, your retirement plan is gonna sustain itself. And the reason this is, is we project a long-term 7% rate of return. You're gonna spend about 4%, and then you've got 3% that's being reinvested back into the pot for inflation. Remember that inflation word was one of our four critical uh, foundational elements of a successful retirement, and you need to save for inflation. 
this automatically does it because 3% is left in the portfolio, then next year you draw 4% of the bigger number and 4% of the bigger number, and your spending goes up each year as your portfolio builds. So this is the financial planning concept that if you spend 4%, your financial assets are likely to uh, maintain themselves. If you spend five or 6%, there is a risk that your money will run out. Um, the next concept then is, well, you know, the stock market 7%, how do we know we're gonna get 7%? If you look at the 20 year period from 1992 to 2012, the total stock market return was 9.6%. 7.1% of that came from market returns and this is annualized. This is every year for that 20 year period annualized and the dividends were two and a half percent. In this period of time, the 1990s, uh, we had a record bull market. So we had great returns in that year. If you take the last 10 years from 2012 to 2002, we had the longest bear market where stock market uh, returns were down, we were still at a 7% rate of return. So in the good time frames, we are above 7%, and in the bad time frames, we're still at 7%. Now, now this is long-term, so long-term you can get these returns, but obviously short-term you can't. So during the same time period, I picked out the best five-year stretch, and I picked out the worst five-year stretch, just to show you the short-term picture. So if you retired in 1995, imagine your retirement portfolio, you're drawing off 4% or 3% or what have you, but it went up 33%, and then 26, and then 23, and 16, and 25. What a fantastic time to retire you would have been golden. Now compare that with retiring in 2000. The very first year, you have a negative six and negative seven and negative 17%. And this is a time period where you wanna draw 4% off your return. Well, it doesn't exist. If you retired here and you withdrew money, you are selling stocks that are down and you're dipping into your principal, and you wanna prevent dipping into the principal during your retirement years. So long-term, we're good. What you have to manage is the short-term's ups and downs, and we'll take a look at that. So let's go back to the cash flow in. So not only do we put the expenses in a fixed and variable column, but we also need to put our income in a fixed and variable column. Now, as I had indicated, dividends are fixed, interest is fixed. So you can pretty well count on this coming in every year. If you have a group of 30 or 40 stocks, maybe one stock doesn't pay the dividend, but as I said, most of them continuously pay dividends. Your Social Security, of course, is fixed, that's not going to go down, and it goes up a little bit each year due to inflation. Your pension is fixed. That's contra contractual in nature, so you know that's coming in, but uh, unlike Social Security where there's a small inflation uh, factor added to it uh, yearly uh, or you know sometimes every other year, the pension is fixed. It does not go up. So there's no inflation protection for that element. And then of course the market return is variable. It could be 24,000 that we need to make our budget. It could be uh, zero. Uh, so we definitely, definitely need to put the, um, the market return in the variable column because we have no idea whether you're gonna get that or not on a year to year basis. Long term, yes, year to year, no. So let's take a look then at um, the next step in the process. 
what you have to do is you have to match your fixed and your variable income and expenses. So take a look at our fixed column first. We had $30, $36,000 worth of income that's fixed. This is your interest, your dividends, and your Social Security and pension. However, we have $43,000 worth of fixed expenses. So we have a shortfall of $7,000 uh, a year on fixed. Some people do not have a shortfall on the fixed income and expense. For example, I have a client whose fixed expenses are uh, $4,000 a month, and he gets $5,000 a month in a pension in the Social Security. So needless to say, he doesn't need to worry about a shortfall because his fixed income already exceeds his fixed expenses. We also then match the variable. So we have variable income, which came from the stock market return, and we have the variable expenses, and if you remember, that was a little bit in the food and clothing uh, category. It was all of the entertainment category and a little bit in the tax category. These expenses were variable and we could turn them on or off. So we have $24,000 worth of variable income, $17,000 worth of variable expenses, so we have a surplus of $7,000. Now the fact that these numbers came out is just simply arbitrary. You could have uh, a, a surplus here and a surplus there. You could have a, a deficiency here, shortfall in both places. So just mathematically, my example worked out the same. It will not be the same in your example. Uh, so, so, so look for that. You could end up with a shortfall here and a shortfall there as well. So, you know, just deal with that once you calculate your own specific numbers. So there's really two issues if you think about it. Um, we have a $7,000 a year shortfall in the fixed. We know that. We have to deal with that issue right up front. Now we deal with it two different ways. Your rainy day account or rainy day fund, we will set aside some money in a short-term savings account that would deal with that on an annual basis. And there is a bond ladder that is used to cover shortfalls in your, um, in your budget. The other risk is, is this variable market return, the market risk. Some years it's up, some years it's down. And the two things that are critically important is when the stock market is down, you need to turn off the variable expenses. Um, I have had clients that have retired in very good years and they never had to deal with this. And I've had clients that have retired in that stretch 2000 to 2003 or so where the stock market was down every single year and they never turned off the things they could turn off. I have clients that would take money out of the stock market when it was down to make a gift to their children. And they're dipping into their principal when they do that. So you have to recognize what's variable as far as your expense and you have to be prepared to turn it off. Or we create a variable spending account. And I'm going to show you how that works to cover this in good years and bad years. The reality is, and again, it depends on your retirement budget and whether you have surpluses or not. In the early years, you're going to have to be disciplined and dedicated to turning off the variable expenses. The longer you're retired and the more time that we get good stock market returns, you will not likely have to turn it off but you'll rely on the variable spending account. So we'll look at these two together. First, um, I think everybody understands the, the concept of a rainy day fund. Um, on a rainy day fund or rainy day account, you wanna have six months worth of expenses just in a savings account. So with our guy who has a $60,000 a year budget, we would want $30,000 in the rainy day fund. 
the rainy day fund, also, you know, your son or daughter uh, has a financial crisis. You can use the rainy day fund to help them. You need a new roof uh, on your house and, and you haven't budgeted for that, um, a, a car repair. So these rainy day funds will cover those emergencies and the opportunities, but they will also cover your annual shortfall on the fixed side, which was $7,000 a year. And the most important is the bond ladder. So let's take a look at that. So what we know about the stock market returns is over the long haul, you will get 7%, 8%, 9%, depending on your, um, your portfolio and how it's uh, invested. If it's invested more aggressively, you might expect more than 7%. If it's invested very conservatively, you might uh, expect a little bit less. But this is basically average on about a 50-50 portfolio between stocks and bonds. So the problem is, is you have market returns that some years are above the line in some years that are below the line. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna go out and we're gonna buy a series of four bonds. They're like rungs on a ladder. That's why they call it a bond ladder. This can be a bond, it can be a certificate of deposit, it could be a treasury bill, for example. So, and they're laddered out. This one comes due in year one, year two, year three, year four. And what happens is the first year of retirement, the stock market is above our 7%. What you're gonna do is sell stocks and harvest the gains and put them in your checking account for the $7,000 variable uh, or fixed shortfall and the $24,000 of variable money that you need. So you don't have to turn off those variable expenses. In year one, you didn't need the bond money, so it will be dropped down to the next rung, year five. Year two of retirement, stock market again is up. You're going to sell stocks, harvest those gains, and then put that in your checking account and cover your shortfalls. Year two. You didn't need that bond that came due, the $30,000. So uh, you can simply move that down to the next rung of the ladder. Now, year three of retirement, the stock market is down. Down doesn't make a difference. It's down 2%. It's down 33%. I don't really care because what I'm going to do is I'm going to take the bond that came due and put that into my checking account. And now I do not need to sell stocks when the market is down to pay for my budget. So pretty simple concept of just creating an insurance policy that you don't have to sell stocks when the stock market is down. So that's how a bond ladder works. Uh, there, you know, it's, it's flexible here. Three years to seven years is about the right time frame. Um, I picked a number, as you can see, that not only covers the $7,000 worth of uh, fixed shortfall, but also covers the variable spending uh, piece. So if I happen to retire in those bad years, 2000, 2001, 2002, I would not have had to turn off my variable spending because I actually built it into my bond ladder. Had I built a bond ladder of only $7,000 a piece, I would have had to turn those off. So again, you can make this number you know, to, to cover all of it, to cover a portion of it, whatever you would like. Um, but I arbitrarily made it big enough to cover both. So in the first three to five years of my retirement, I don't have to give up my entertainment budget. I can, but I don't have to. So, uh, also saving for inflation. Again, we you know we talk about inflation. 
a part of your portfolio has to be reinvested each year because as you go forward, you need more money in the pot to cover the same expenses. So if you look at a 2% inflation rate, and we started in year one with a portfolio of 800,000, next year you need $816,000 just to stay even. If you go out to year 20, you need 1,188,000 just to stay even with your $60,000 budget. So um, it is important in the cash flow analysis and, and the money management to create a system for saving for inflation. Remember the system here that was that out of the 7% return, we're gonna spend 4% and 3% is gonna be reinvested uh, in the good years. Obviously you can't do that in the bad years, but in the good years for uh, your inflation protection. So uh, let's put this uh, all together. And the first thing we're gonna do is we're gonna set up some accounts. You've got your rainy day fund. As I said, that's typically about uh, a half a year. So our budget's 60, we want $30,000 in the rainy day account. Uh, we have the bond ladder. I had four years at $30,000 a piece. So we have $120,000 there. We have our variable spending account, which I've started out as zero because I'm just retiring. And I have my portfolio of $800,000. So these are the accounts that I set up. And again, this is a system, it's mechanical. Set up these four different accounts and then follow the system and you're more likely not to spend principal or deplete your assets. And I also set up a checking account. Of course, this is to pay my day-to-day -day bills, which I've projected at $60,000 a year. So let's see what happens then as we go forward. Uh, the rainy day accounts there, I'm not, uh, I haven't redrawn that, so it hasn't disappeared, it's just floating out here. So year one, the market's up 10%. My dividends, my Social Security, and my pension, which was fixed, will automatically show up in my checking account. So I know that's gonna happen at the beginning of the year. Now this happens to be a good year, the first year of my retirement. The stock market is up 10%, so I've made $80,000 in market return. Now what am I gonna do with that market return? Well first, I'm gonna put $24,000 of that gain that I've harvested. I've sold stocks, so I've I've captured that gain. It's not just on paper. I've sold the stocks and the investments and the bonds that were up. And I put $24,000 of that into my checking account, so now I can cover my $60,000 budget for the year. As I indicated, I need a bigger portfolio next year due to inflation, so I'm gonna take $16,000 of that gain and I'm gonna move it back to my portfolio or just let it sit in my portfolio. So now I've got 816,000, which is what I need for next year's uh, budget with inflation added. And I have $40,000 left over. Well, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna put that $40,000 into my variable spending account. So in future years, when the market is down, I don't have to turn off my variable spending. With this extra surplus, I really have lots of choices. I could just put more than 16,000 in my portfolio. I could put the whole 40 or something less in my variable spending account. And I certainly could have added one more rung to my bond ladder. I could have put, uh, 10,000 here and bought one more rung. So instead of four years where the protection, I have five. So there are choices each year. Of course, these are fun choices. This, this is the good year. This is when you have surplus uh, and you get to allocate your surplus 
to the various accounts that, that protect you. I could have added more to my rainy day fund as well if I wanted to. So this is a year or an example when the stock market is up. Now, when the stock market is up, what is our priority? So as I ind indicated, first I put money in my checking account for my current needs. That was the first priority I had. I have a $60,000 budget. I want to spend the whole 60,000. So I added money to my checking account to cover that budgetary shortfall. You saw the second thing I did is I automatically protected the inflation number. So I set aside 16,000, added it back to the portfolio or left it in the portfolio. So next year I'm starting with 816 versus 800,000. Then if there's any extra, you can put it in the variable spending account. You can buy a bond ladder. You can add more to the portfolio, or you can make gifts uh, to your children or, or spend extra money. As uh, I, I indicated, I've had a number of clients and their retirement has fallen apart, is that they, they put gifts to their children and their grandchildren up here rather than at the bottom. Um, so, so be able to turn that on and off each year. So what happens in a down market? So year two of my retirement, the market is down 15%. So now I have a loss. My $816,000 portfolio is $693,000. That's the 15% loss. So my dividends, my social security, and my pension are automatic. Those are fixed. They end up in my checking account. And I need $7,000 to $24,000 to add to my checking account for my fixed shortfall of seven and my variable shortfall of $24,000. So what can I do? Uh, in this year, I could take one of the bond ladders, uh, the rung, and take that money and put it into my checking account. If you remember, I had $30,000 a year coming due each year. I could simply cash in that CD that year, put it in my checking account, and I'm covered. I could use my variable spending account. So I could take some of this money and put it into my checking account. So as you see in good years, we're going to create a variable surplus and a variable spending account that will allow you to cover the bad years. Or I could have turned off the variable expenses. I wouldn't have taken a trip that year. I wouldn't have uh, gone to the movies or uh, you know, bought a new car or did something that's in that entertainment category uh, so that instead of spending the 17,000, I didn't spend the 17,000 and then I would have only needed to add 7,000. So as you can see, there are choices. It's not black and white. There are going to be good years and you can choose to take the surplus and put it in a, very, uh, a variety of, of accounts. And there are bad years. And if you've done that, again, in a system, you'll have plenty of options to cover the bad years. That's really what cash flow is all about, is understanding the variable nature of your cash flow and the fixed, and then dealing with the variable nature of it with these various accounts so you don't have to sell stocks. I don't want to sell stocks when my portfolio is down 15% because I will never make that up and I will never recover. So the, the challenge to you on this cash flow uh, is, is recognize what your variable costs are and be prepared to turn that off. You can turn it on, you can turn it off. In good years, it's on, and in bad years, it's off. Number two, remember to save for inflation. 
that's critically important um, in the good years to set aside money so you're inflation protected. And I think number three is don't reestablish or reset your budget based on the short term. If you remember like 95 through uh, uh, 96, 97, 98, 99, we had 32%, 35%, 23% returns in the market. I had clients that retired in those time frames and immediately went out and bought a new house or bought a house in Florida or increased their overhead because they projected that the returns were going to be based on 30% a year. Obviously, that can't happen. <clears throat> so in those short-term years, when you have really good returns, don't reset your budget. You still want to project the long-term as a 7%, 8%, 9% rate of return, and only um, reset your budget based on your variable spending account, your fixed income increases, uh, and, and the portfolio increases. So um, that is the, the lesson on uh, cash flow. As you can see, it's very methodical. It's very system-oriented. It, it, it is not very difficult to do this. You simply set up the proper accounts and manage the cash flow to protect yourself from the stock market being down and being forced to sell stocks uh, you know, and, and dip into your principal. So uh, thank you for joining me in this presentation. I hope this helps you create a successful retirement.